the viewers at home, how are you? Welcome back to our Second Life eTalk event presented by a collaboration between Jijak and Unlocket.com. Bringing up the main theme, which is help the earth act now. Before we move on, my name is Shani from Jijak In, and I will be the moderator for this last session. And for this time round, it will be a little bit different from the previous sessions because we have a very special guest from Lombok. But before I introduce you guys to our guest, I will emphasize once again on our donation system. So in commemoration of Earth Day, this event will be collecting donations from you guys to help the COVID-19 caretakers and medic teams. Now how to donate is as simple as scanning the barcode displayed right now on the screen. This will direct you right away to their ticketing or donation registration page. This donation will take form in a form of ticket buying. So you can donate and per by purchasing the tickets and this value will then be donated through baramaljaria.org and Alpha JW Ventures. For every, um, for every account or email, it is limited that you can only buy up to maximum donation of five tickets. So if you wanna donate more than that, you might need to create a new account or register with another email. Okay, so without any further ado, as I've mentioned, we have a very special and interesting guest for today's last session, who's very passionate in what she do, and she's a project manager from Gilly Echo Trust Lombok. Hi, Delphine. Hi, hi, Shani. How are you? Hi, hi, I'm good. I'm all good. How are you there? How's everything? Well, it's a confinement, but we are confined on a very nice island, so we okay, we can still get out of our house and enjoy the oceans and the nature here with no tourists. Oh my God, that must have been so nice. At least you still get to have to enjoy that great view there in Lombok. Exactly. And okay, so <laughs> where are you actually from and what made you move to Indonesia? Uh, I'm originally from France and I grew up in the suburb of Paris. And uh, when I finished my study, I'm an engineer in biology. I decided to go traveling before working. And uh, so I traveled for about two years and then didn't want to go home. So, and there was one country that I really enjoyed when I visited, it was Indonesia. So I decided to come back to Indonesia and settle in as a first as a diving instructor. I see. Um, okay. That's actually very interesting to know that you really love Indonesia that made you move all the way here. Okay. Yeah, so the people, the people, the smiles and the difference of culture and the nature here is amazing and everyone is living from nature. You know, most of the tourism here is because of the nature. That's why like diving in the oceans and the coral reef in Indonesia is so nice and so appreciated by so many tourists coming back here just to enjoy how beautiful it is. I see, I see. That's that's awesome. What an awesome story. Okay, so before we actually go into any deeper discussion with you, uh, can I have you to share about more about yourself? Like, can you introduce yourself? Maybe share about, about Gilly Echo Trust a little bit more? Okay, sure. So my name is Delphine and as I said, I'm French and uh, I first arrived on the island of Gili Trongans, which is next to Lombok. And everyone I think know, know Gili Trongan. It's a beautiful island, very touristic. And um, <coughs> um, in 2004, I came here to do my dive master and instructor course because I love the diving but also because I love this little island with no motorbike and no cars. Uh, I love horses, so it was uh, perfect for me. It was like the beautiful place. Going to work on a horse or on a bicycle is beautiful. And then um, working as a diving instructor, my boss, Anna Walker, um, the owner of Big Bubble Dive, uh, was also helping the Gilico Trust that already existed since 2000. And so 
I was looking into it and how I could help and things like this rather than just teaching diving. And uh, so I joined the Gili Eco Trust with uh, the Biorock Reef Restoration Technology by uh, bringing it onto the island and then setting up some workshops and then the scientists coming over. And now we have about 150 Biorock reefs around the island and that's how I joined the Gili Eco Trust. And by 2009, we started to not only help the reefs and the oceans, but also um, helping the land because most of the pollution comes from land and human impact. So we went into education, animal welfare, and then waste management and trying to uh, change the things on the island with the plastic and uh, trying to make the, the, the island like an eco example and uh, having like sustainable tourism. It's, it's still a dream more than a goal because the touristic development and everyone thinking about their profit rather than about the nature is still happening. But at least we are here to just try to catch up on the development. And 2018 in Gili and, and Lombok, we got a very bad earthquake and then it created something uh, beautiful on the island with the solidarity and everyone working together and we could set things up better for waste management for example and for protection of the nature and now it's a global crisis but on the island we are maybe 500 people at the moment and and uh, everyone is doing their bits and everyone is just waiting for the tourists to come back but it will be different because we don't want it to turn the same way we are learning the lesson from what's happening now, what happened to us before. And having those opportunities of starting over rather than being crowded with tourists every day, it's, it's really good. So we can set, set things up at the moment to be prepared for when the tourists come back and get the education and uh, more awareness for the environment and for the nature on this uh, beautiful island of Gili Trongan. I see, I see. So actually, uh, Gilead Eco Trust has been established for 10 years, is it? More than 10 years. Uh, the Gilead Eco Trust was created in 2000. It's called the Ayasan Ecosystem Gilinda. <coughs> Sorry. And it was first created to, to support SADGAS. And there was a, there was a group of uh, youth, young Indonesian who were dedicated to protect the sea and the coral reef from dynamite fishing and destructive fishing method. So they, after a few months of patrolling, they run out of money and motivation. So they ask the dive shops on the island to, do, to create some kind of reef donation. Um, so they could, the Gili Eco Trust could support sad gas efforts. And when I joined in 2004, we were doing the Biorock Reef restoration, but also placing mooring buoys so people stop anchoring and we're starting other reef conservation. And the most important been always like uh, raising awareness and educating people and trying to get people to enjoy the coral reef, but also not destroy. I see. So you've stayed in Lombok since the day you, the year you joined Gili Eco Trust in 2004. Or was it way before that already? Yeah, I joined 2004. I was, uh, that's when I settled in, in uh, Gili Trangan and uh, visited Indonesia maybe two years before for four months and uh, went a bit everywhere just to see how lush it was and, and things like this. And then someone told me Gili Trangan will be good for diving and horses and uh, getting my diving course. And so I was like, okay, cool. I take the opportunity to come instead of going back to France and trying to find a job. I see. So, yeah. so as you've mentioned before about the earthquake that happened in Lombok, did that actually had any severe effect to the business or the organization? Um, it was, 
it was a really hard time and the island was was closed for for a month and uh, many things were destroyed on the island and we were only a few people staying here to clean up and clean up the dangerous walls and uh, and empty kitchens clean up everything but then also starting to rebuild and make the island ready for when the tourists will be able to come back and so the income. Um, but the, for the, the association, the fact that we help all the animals during, the, during that time and, uh, and that we were still here trying to sort everything out and, and dealing with the rubbish every day. It actually, we got loads of donation from all over the world and what happening now is totally different is global so you can't really ask for donation when you're a little island so we have to just get ready here for for when it comes back to life and uh, and so we could set things better i see i see okay so just now you've mentioned as well about the dynamite fishing that people do do actually uh, does that actually still take place in a lot of areas in Indonesia? And what are your thoughts on it actually? Uh, dynamite fishing is still happening all over Indonesia. Uh, not that much in, uh, nothing in the Gilis. It's a marine protected area and we work with the BKKPN and the DKP and, um, and they are patrolling, but uh, East Lombok is still happening all over all of us, Sulawesi, it's still happening. And uh, it's, uh, it's a shame because it's destroying the whole habitat. So you, you kill the fish, you've got lots of fish for one day, but then the next day you go there and, and none of the fish are there or back because the habitat is destroyed, their food and their home is totally destroyed. So you have to go and fish further and further away every day. Um, because you destroyed the habitats of all the fish. And then for divers or for tourism or snorkeling is, uh, <coughs> yes, is it, it doesn't leave anything, no fish there and nobody can enjoy and seeing just rubble. So it kills everything, not only the income from fishing, but also the income from tourism. Um, but there are lots of other destructive fishing methods that are still happening in Indonesia, dynamite is not that much, I think, because people start understanding, but cyanide fishing and then murami fishing with, like, with compressor and dragging nets is still happening. And this is destroying the local reefs. But then in the oceans, you've got the long line and the goss net and gill nets. And this is destroying everything as well and taking way more fish than what is needed. And when you talk about bycatch of all the different species that you don't target when you fish, um, yeah, it's horrible how much they can take. So the, the, the worst uh, seafood you can eat in terms, in, in terms of sustainability and bycatch is shrimp and prawn. And so boycott that from your seafood menu. And the best one is actually squid and calamari because there's no bycatch, there's <laughs> no destruction, and it's still nice to eat. Um, so yeah, you know what to do. Acting for tomorrow is changing your diet. If you change your diet tomorrow, you, we can actually <laughs> save the planet as individuals. I see, I see. So guys, you should change all of our diets to save the planet, as what Delphin say, so we can eat squid starting from tomorrow. No more yeah. fish, no more delicious yeah <laughs> okay okay um next question that I, I have for you is what do you think are the main problem in this tourist areas and how severely has it infected the environment maybe not only just in Lombok but in a lot of other touristy areas such as Bali and everywhere else um I think the main issue is people are, are thinking first about profits and money coming in fast rather than sustainability and trying to think when you think about sustainability that means it's a long-term thinking you might invest more money the first day but over the long term you you get you 
your investment back and you're actually protecting the nature as well to be able to do it for a longer time. And um, in tourism, there's a lot of competition in between the different resorts and jealousy and things like this. And uh, so that if you don't have a consensus of solidarity of all the businesses working together towards sustainability of the whole island, like Lombok or Bali or Gilitrongan, then it's hard to get everyone moving towards the same thing. Now it's getting trendy and it's good marketing to be an eco resort. And, and, but where are the rules if there are some you know, Green Star Hotel or things like this, or if Booking.com actually gives some recommendation to the hotels actually doing something sustainable, but with proper rules and checkup, then it could go all together. The shame is that it's rarely going all together and they're more against one another. And then you see all the sewage going into the sea in Bali. And then, and then you see people like in Gilitrong and everything is so close. You get the music super loud in one bar and you pass to the next one is the music super loud there as well. And then the mosque behind and it's like, whoa, I thought it was a paradisiac quiet island. And it's like, so yeah, it's just the example of like, um, it might come with the global crisis that we, we are all having at the moment. We're not all on the same boat, but kind of because it's global. So maybe it's gonna wake people up and they start working together to protect the whole environment and ecosystem where they make money from, rather than going against one another and just always being fighting or jealous or offended or things like this. So it, I've, I hope it's in, like, like I say in, in Gilitrong and it's smaller and uh, we're quite lucky that we had all those different hard things to go through because it created a very nice group of people always here to help and thinking the same and we're not fighting, you know, them maybe business over business is still looking at what the other is doing, but most of the time is, is on, the, on the right way. So, yeah. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, I actually agree that people are actually really looking more towards the money than the sustainability of the world. And regarding that side of the discussion that you have just talked about, I want to ask you, like, is there any upcoming projects that you guys are working on recently, maybe to help this process to achieve sustainability? Um, just now you mentioned that that was a dream for you guys, but have you had any recent discussion about an upcoming project that could maybe make that sustainability as a goal rather than a dream? Yeah, I mean, it's still a goal, but it's a dream goal. I think if it, like because our, our criteria of perfections are quite high. But uh, yes, we have a project ongoing that we're getting ready for the last few years, and it's for waste management. Um, and uh, we've tried many different things, and uh, to to find out what was the best to pursue. And we think with the amount of tourists coming here and the amount of businesses and people working on the island, we think that education and raising awareness is the most important to get everyone to be aware about the waste. And uh, most important, everyone selecting or separating their rubbish from its source. So then you could actually recycle up to 80% of the rubbish compost a lot and then here we're doing a lot with with the glass with glass bricks and glasses and things like this so um upcycling recycling and knowing what you should buy rather than other things and and rather than having one socialization event one time we think the best is is to have a team of eco ranger so which will offer a daily education so we were just we're putting everything in place but we also need the landfill not to be just a landfill but to have proper facilities and the uh, PU Pusat just built finished the building on the in January this year and so now everything is there all the machineries are there and now working about all the paperwork and the bureaucracy to get everything it run 
run to get it running with um, with Kaelu, so Kabupaten Lombok Utara. And uh, so all the waste could be dealt there, but this place is not going to become another landfill if we have the education door to door on a daily basis. That means the Eco Ranger works work with the, the waste collector. So the waste collector are going into a place, business or local place, and they look at the rubbish. It's not separated properly, at least organic and non-organic. They don't pick it up, but they call an eco ranger. And the eco ranger comes and go through the bins with the people working in the business or from this household to be able to separate everything organic, non-organic, recycling, glass if needed as well. And at the same time, offering this daily personal education with about, oh, you should buy this rather than this because this is recyclable and then this. And so this can only work because the information in one socialization event is received by about 10% of people. And those 10% of people will retain only 10% of the information. So if you want to make a difference in stem of sustainability, you need to stop the bad human impact. And for that, you need to change people's habit. So it's quite nice to be able to restore the reef and, uh, and help the cats and the horses on the island. It's actually super easy, but with waste, you need to work with human and to change human's habit, you need to go through a daily education and repetition as much as you can so it becomes like a habit and a routine and then they understand that what they're doing is actually helping them plan their planet and and the island as well then for the planet they can also change their diet and everything that i said before <laughs> if they want to prevent global warming but locally and and to make the island sustainable we need to be able to deal with the waste properly because the island otherwise become a rubbish dump on its own. Awesome, awesome. That's very great actually to hear about the ongoing projects that you guys have planned. And I really do hope that it will be a great success because it will totally help not only um, the tourist areas, not only the environment, but the world. And um, about the awareness that we should build to people, I would love to discuss with you again on, on that later on. But for now, I heard that you, you have prepared a presentation for us and some slides that you would like to show. Yeah, I'm just going to show a few things on the island, but it's to come to the same conclusion that the we think our best solution is the daily education and the eco rangers going door to door on the island. But yes, I'm going to show you a little presentation. I'm going to start now if I share my screen uh, up. Here we go. It works. Yeah. So we are in Gili Trangan and it's a very small touristic island. And, um, but on a very small island like this, we're actually representing the all of Indonesia and all the issues that are happening on all the different 17,000 plus plus islands that we have in Indonesia. Got beautiful coral reef and, and many turtles around the island, but we also have a lot of rubbish. And because the island receive up to um, the free gillies, up to 1 million tourists per year, it's a lot of people passing by and so it's a lot of sewage and uh, pollution and most of it plastic. So, and not only the, what the island produces, but also all the rubbish that is thrown on land is usually into riverbeds or, or not really into any landfill. And so as soon as it rains, everything flows into the ocean. So, the, the island is a beautiful place to live and it's also a beautiful place where we can learn really fast how our actions uh, can be positive or negative. We can see the consequences of our action really quickly and not only our local actions, but also what's happening in the world with global warming and mass coral bleaching, but also with all the rubbish coming from all the different islands um, around us. So 
the the front scene in Gilitrongan is beautiful with lots of businesses, sunbed, clear turquoise water. But the bad the bad side is what we can see in the back back of many businesses, and this is not even the dump. And there's just people illegally dumping and all their domestic rubbish. And as you can see, everything is mixed up. So you've got uh, colored plastic bag, clear plastic bags, sachet, cans, organic, and everything is there. Um, and this we can see it in many places. In Labuan Bajo, that's another example of a touristic place where they get strong currents bringing a lot of rubbish. And uh, there's, you can't even see the sand anymore. The beach is just covered of plastic and waste. So many scientists are saying that by 2030, there will be more gar garbage than fish in the ocean. Actually, I think it's already there because they're not counting the microplastic that is, that is there for already more than 30 years and uh, that the fish are eating. And then so that if you're still eating fish, you're eating as well. Um, this is a view of Gilitrongan. So Monterey is a very good income for tourism, um, but unfortunately they're looking for plankton and they're also looking, they encounter a lot of plastic. This is a little video where you can see the Monterey is a bit confused with everything happening around but still seeing that there is a place where it looks like a lot of plankton and is actually a lot of rubbish. Um, so this rubbish either ends up on our beach or disintegrate in the sea into microplastic that then the, the manta rays or other plankton feeder can't make any difference from. So they're just eating everything. Manta rays are best alive but in clear water as well. There's a lot of fishing for manta rays or sharks, sorry, I started again. Um, so yeah, protect the oceans and clean up. As soon as you go onto the beach, just try to pick up at least five pieces of rubbish, but I'm sure you can find more. Uh, so on Gilitrongan, we organize a beach cleanup every week land cleanup as well, underwater cleanup, as we're doing paddle boarding as well. We're taking people on recycle tours so they can see the bad side of Gilitrongan and also uh, bank sampa, uh, glass upcycling facilities and everything that, that they can do to help while on the island. But the plastic is still coming back and still coming back. So we need to focus on the issue of it for where it comes from, the source of the problem. And uh, for these, it goes through education and not only providing bins to people, but having places that now many places are open like this bank sampa, where people can get, bring their rubbish and get rice or money. We are upcycling all the glass bottles on the island, making glasses, ashtrays, but also crushing the glass bottle into sand so we can make bricks and use the sand for building material. Composting for already a quite a while and permaculture garden and educational events. But unfortunately, the dump is still getting bigger and bigger and uh, Indonesia is still the second largest ocean polluter in the world. And the um, mid picture is also in Trangan. This is our dump with the cow eating everything. I was saying the fish were eating a lot of plastic, but actually the cows on Gili Trangan are probably eating even more than the fish. Uh, this is our dump. And now is uh, much higher than this. And um, when you read the, the laws about rubbish disposal uh, in Indonesia, all the, the law books are beautiful and you think it's the, the Tiga Air and the Ompat Air and everything is there and it's done properly. But actually there is absolutely no control, no enforcement and most of everything is no proper education. And because there is no control and enforcement, people take the educational event as just a nice day to get free food and a t-shirt.
but it's really rare to see the people changing the habit from one socialization event. So how we will educate the population, burning plastic, it's not only bad for our lungs, it's also bad for our skin, um, but it's also bad for our ocean and for the air we breathe because everything, all the particles are going up into the air and then as soon as it rains, it's falling back into the earth or the ocean. So even more plastic if you're burning it. So the best if you don't know how to dispose your rubbish is to put it in a hole into a landfill, but not burning it because you're not only killing your health, but killing the planet as well and the oceans. So trying not to have a dump like this, that means people, everyone could uh, separate their rubbish. And so what will come onto the dump will be only the compost and only the organic food rather than a mix of everything. Because uh, we don't have the facilities, we don't have enough staff to be the one separating everything when some bits of rubbish are tiny and some are really big. And the most important one is to separate organic from non-organic first. And our plan is to combine a way to transform the residue, so the rubbish that it is not, that we can't recycle, upcycle or do anything into waste to energy technology, because the island needs a lot of energy with tourism, but to also combine that with a team of eco ranger to educate people about waste selection, reducing waste, recycling and upcycling on a daily basis. That means door to door, working with the waste collector. And when, when someone hasn't separated their rubbish properly, then the eco ranger come to separate with them. Otherwise the rubbish won't be collected. So we hope to uh, start putting in place the eco ranger after the coronavirus when the island starts slowly to go back into life. We have the facilities and all the machineries with uh, the TPST that the, the PU Pusat has built and the waste to energy power plant. This is coming from the Finland government and the uh, PT on, in Indonesia who will be uh, dealing with it and we just give them our rubbish and they give us some uh, diesel or solar that we could sell to Pertamina or use for the generator for any issue. And it will only work with the Green Patrol and the Eco Ranger. Um, there will be a team of people doing continual fun education um, on a daily basis for anyone who is confused about separating their rubbish. Then we can dream even bigger with banning any single use plastic, such as straws. Many people on the island already are not using plastic straw, but compostable one or paper one. Um, and, but the plastic bags are still an issue as everyone is still using, many people are still using plastic bags and mostly the local population going to buy the nasty bunkus rather than taking a Tupperware box. So, refill your water bottle, get your Tupperware box to go buy your nasi and, uh, do, and use a bag more than one time. And if you can have a cotton bag is much better than plastic because it lasts longer. And then replicate and repeat, repeat, repeat because the education can only work with uh, repetition. And so raising awareness can really have uh, consequences on changing people's ha habits. And then expand if we succeed, then Gili Trangan could be the eco example for other touristic island. And no, we're not gonna give up and that's why we're dreaming big. We think everything is possible. I'm gonna finish this maybe for, more, for some questions after, but thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I was clear. And again, you can contact me uh, through the Gili Eco Trust website or, or my phone or whatever. So I can give you some tips and tricks that you can apply on a daily basis, change a few habits so you can actually help locally, but also help to save the planet as an individual rather than hoping 
that the government or the big lobbying company will actually do something. It starts by you and you can start tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing us a lot of great insights, Delphine. And before moving on to any more questions, yes, thank you. Before moving on to any more questions from me, we have several questions from the viewers. So first question would be, is it true that using cleaner transportation can help coral growth? And how come the pollution on air contributes to harm to ocean quality? Okay, so yes, uh, using greener transportation will help in terms of carbon footprint. So greener trans transportation, that means that you're releasing less CO2 into the atmosphere. And CO2 and methane are the two gases that are actually warming up our Earth. Global warming is happening. And and uh, so climate change, and that's why now we often have, um, often have mass coal bleaching, and that's when the ocean gets too warm and the coal will die from this high temperature. So global warming is, is killing our coral reef globally. But also when I said about when you burn any plastic, you releasing a lot of particles into the air that are flowing with the heat going up into the atmosphere. And then it will form a cloud of particles that will fall back onto the earth and in the oceans as soon as it rains. So if you burn your plastic, you're actually polluting not only from the CO2 and the methane that is produced, from burning, but also from all the tiny particles that are going to fall back onto the earth and contaminate your soil if you're growing your own vegetables or even whatever you're eating, or into the sea directly and polluting the sea with metals and oil and other chemicals and microplastic in particular. I see, I see. Well, that's actually very interesting to know because I didn't even know about it. I'm not aware of that at all. Wow, thank you for sharing such an awesome thank answer, Delphine. Uh, I hope that answers the question from Bogar here. And moving on to the next question, we have a question from Ega Bella. Number of breakthroughs were carried out by the NTB local government. One of them is the zero waste program. What do you think of the program? And if Gili Eco Trust is also a part of that program? Um, yes, we are zero waste is a beautiful program again. But um, when I, uh, earlier I said dream big and everything is possible, actually zero waste is not possible. <laughs> so, no, oh, I see. The waste needs to go somewhere. <laughs> so, um, yes, is the, the government is uh, spending a lot of money into the zero waste program. Many people are um, having the opportunity of making a loan or receiving money from the government to set up bank sampa and to uh, offer recycling, uh, upcycling uh, facilities and opportunities. But they will never be zero waste because everything is, is transported into things. If we come back 100 years back and set it up without the plastic, then it could be zero waste. But now, and the, the way the planet is going, it's not going to happen. The waste will always be there. Then you have to find a way of making money from that waste, or, cre or like we said, waste to energy. Um, waste to something else that you could use. So recycling is you transform waste into the same, same kind of product, but new. Upcycling is making uh, some waste into a different product, but that can be used in different matters. And then uh, zero waste is not really possible unless you transform the waste. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's many ways of like, you can make petrol, uh, back from waste, but then we're not sure about the emission and again all the gas and the heat and how much energy it needs to be used for that and the contamination of the water for the 
the cooling system. So there's still lots of things to study. But in some countries like Sweden, it works really well, but they need a lot of heat and energy because they go for winter. So in Indonesia, you have to find another way. Um, and so if the waste could be used for the petrol generator, because Indonesia is still using petrol generator for the electricity, that, that could work. But again, just having to make sure that there's no uh, side effects or bad effects from the technology. See, I see. Wow. Okay. So you believe in the transformation more? Yeah, because uh, everyone is producing waste. It's 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 a matter of fact. We go to a shop, we buy some things that are packaged. Uh, you don't only eat veggies, and uh, and uh, just even just you close or things into your house. At some point, they'll become they'll become waste. Nothing is is goes into infinite, you know. And so so yeah, it's just having. I think is more transforming it and to be reused and even if it's in another in another way i understand i actually agree with you on that discussion i really 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 agree on that transformation part because zero waste is it's difficult to achieve but i wouldn't say that it's impossible as well but slowly step by step through that transformation that you have discussed i believe we can reach a greater environment as condi environment condition as well and moving on to another question by dion do you find it hard to find allies or tourism provider or private businesses such as hotel resorts fnbs and recreational boards that has responsible and same mission in ecotourism <laughs> um again we we we're quite lucky because the island is is pretty small we've got maybe 500 businesses on the island and uh, to try they all they all want to support because they they all uh, care for the island and and many have understand that they have to go through the green step but they still, they still don't want to change too many things in within their business. So some are making great efforts, and others not, not that much. Then, uh, then it's then it's all playing on the marketing and the social media on who we're gonna recommend more and who are we not recommending that much. So then, if they want to join. Uh, we've got the Gilly Green Award where many businesses have joined and, and giving them guidelines so they, that they can apply in their business. Um, and then, uh, then now is more and more joining. And as I said, after the earthquake, there's even more joining because they could see that we have to make the island strong together rather than fighting against one another or copying what the other is doing, but not for the good reason. There's, so uh, before there was not that many business when I first arrived and I was more playing on the, their ego and uh, feel, making them feel, feel guilty. So playing on the ego and jealousy and competition is that, oh, next door they're investing in a bioroc to restore the reef, what about you? And oh, those ones have paid for 150 rubbish bins for the village, how many are you gonna buy? And that was more my way like, uh, before, but now is, is there is a good there is a good start on the island and it's more by offering them the solution that they can put in place but again they don't always have the time or the willingness to do it or the information from the manager or the director doesn't always go down all the way to the staff who are like cleaning the rooms or waiters or in the kitchen so that's why we think with the eco ranger who are going to talk to everyone and educate and raise awareness on a daily basis, we could actually succeed more. And then the businesses will be even happier because it's not only them signing some guidelines, but we then we are there to help them making sure those guidelines are followed by their whole staff. I see, I see, I see. Oh, okay, I understand. Okay, um, moving on to our last question before I ask you another 
thing in another discussion. So the last question would be from Rachel. Most people are aware of these waste management issues, but only few acted accordingly. How should we influence people to change their behavior towards the problem? How to change people is educate, raise awareness, and give it a good example on a daily basis. And, uh, and then don't be shy to talk to anyone. You go in the shop, you go and buy a magazine. They want to give you a plastic bag and it's like, no thanks. I don't want the plastic bag. Look, I've got my bag. I'm just going to buy a nasi, but you already have your, your box, your plastic box ready rather than taking the plastic paper and the plastic bag to bring your nasi home. So it's giving the example and teaching anyone. It is not only the kids at school, but also your grandparents, anyone around, uh, your neighbor, all there are many people who have like uh, Pambantu and people dealing with all of this in the kitchen, in the garden. And, and but actually they're, they're the one who need to know because it's not the owner of the house who's dealing with the rubbish, but that's them. And then the most important to realize things like this. So yeah, it's a simple way of explaining and how they can make an impact. And uh, yeah, separating the rubbish starting and then other actions that they can take on a, on a daily basis. But yeah, giving the good example, offering solution rather than blaming and encouraging people to change their habits. I see, I see. So I really think that most people are actually educated on this matter, but it's just that they're not taking actions. Am I correct? Yeah, or because they maybe don't realize how much their impact could change, could change the world. And it, it starts uh, tomorrow and it starts locally because many people get disappointed or like really pessimistic when you look at the state of the planet and the state of the earth globally, but actually is, is how you can make action from right now, make your own compost and then grow your own veggies, even if it's in a pot on a balcony, it already makes, makes a big difference. So yeah, people often uh, don't stick to the, what they've learned is because they can't see the impact they still see someone coming to collect their rubbish every day, but then they don't live on the dump and they don't see the nightmare on the dump. That's why, again, Gilly is perfect place to learn because you walk one kilometer on the island to, and you can see the, the rubbish tip, which is a hill in the, middle of, in the middle of the island. So whatever you buy that is gonna make waste is gonna end up there. So yes, yeah, th that is most of the time, I think it's because people don't realize because they don't see it. They don't see the impact or a good way, the positive one. I see, I see, I see. Yes, I actually do agree with you on that as well. And another question from me myself is that, a lot of people are very concerned about all of this waste, but can you elaborate more on how, would, how, how are this waste management being uh, taken place and what's the importance of this repetitive education not only to the people but to a lot of businesses on having a good waste management system? Well, the... the the waste issue is global and we've got too much waste everywhere. And, uh, but on the, the problem is that most of the waste uh, is recyclable or reusable, but because it's not separated properly, it ends up on landfill or in ocean. So the, the major issue with waste that is accumulating, it's because it's not sorted properly. And uh, the easiest is to sort it as soon as you make it and you're gonna put it in that bin, that bin or that bin, rather than expecting people sorting the rubbish afterwards. When it's so much, it's so 
easy to actually just sort it from when it's paper, they're plastic, they're organic, they're, and, and uh, so yeah, I think it, people don't realize that this is the way it can help. You know, they say, and maybe only 10% of the waste is actually properly recycled around the world. And uh, so we also need to reduce the waste. And that's why I said like Tupperware box, reusable bag, re refillable bottles and things like this. There are many ways. Um, but because the government is not making clear action with the power they have, you have to make the difference. And the only difference it is with waste is to separate it and to bring it to the proper place. You bring your recycling to, to and your glass to a bank sampa, and the rest is going to landfill or buried or anything like this. And when, when I said about the government, like the government could make big difference because uh, everyone is paying tax. We, are, uh, we had a tax amnesty a few years ago and it, it could have made a big could have made a big change at the same time as with the zero waste challenge or goal. Because if you start taxing companies that, that are producing packaging that are not recyclable, you, you give them more tax because they're using sachet or silver lining aluminium mixed with plastic packaging, they pay more tax because they're polluting the planet and they're not, and they're filling up the landfill and the oceans with plastic, bad one. And then for any companies that is deciding into compostable packaging or recyclable packaging, then they pay less tax or they even get bonuses. I don't know, but you need to make the, the bad one pay. Otherwise they're never gonna exchange. So the government could really act there, but I think there's problem with politics that I'm not really interested in, but those big companies, the bad ones are also the one paying for the campaigns. So I think that's where the problem resides. <laughs> so, but anyway, I still try to tell Djokovic to make a, a decision like this. It's like, come on, tax those ones. You know, Unilever, <laughs> it's not only from the pine oil, it's also from the packaging. <laughs> Stop destroying the forest, but also <laughs> stop filling up the ocean with plastic. <laughs> That's just in one example. There are many other companies that are like them. So yeah. I see, I see. Okay. So, yeah, as an in <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> okay. Um before I get ready to close down the session, uh, I would like to ask you two more questions from our viewers. One of them is from Diana. She say, um, how do you respond to people who keep on saying, you're just one person or a bunch of people? It doesn't even matter what you do. How big of an impact, would, how big of an impact do you make if it's just a few people? <laughs> The, yeah, the biggest threat for our planet is, uh, is to think that someone else will save it. So that's not the way I think, and that's why I'm happy to contribute tonight, is because I think the main thing is to teach people. And so people that are harassing you or getting whatever, and is like, why do you bother? You see the state of the planet, you know? Some people like, like will tell me, why do you bother pick up all those plastic from the beach? It will still come tomorrow. Yes, but I, I do my bit. I'm like a little colibri. And if I can't turn the fire off while my lifetime, at least I've done my bit. I agree, I agree, I agree. I actually do agree that it actually takes that one person to step up their game first and take that action before everyone else follows actually. But Diana as well did mention that they have big respect for you guys and that the movement are so big and they love you, uh, she loves your program. So thank you, Diana, for sharing about that. And one more question, one more question would be from Pops. Um, there are possibilities that, that some of the waste in Gili were coming from nearby islands like Lombok and Bali. Are there any joint effort or collaborations with other eco-communities in those islands? 
Oh yeah. Uh, yes, there's loads of rubbish coming from Lombok as soon as it rains, and because many of the villages um, um, uh, up in, in the mountains and uh, put all their rubbish in the river because there is no collection, there is no indication, they don't separate the rubbish. But uh, we have a big, uh, we've got a big group which is uh, Lombok Pedulilinkungen. With connecting many uh, rubbish bank and many people all around who are trying to share solutions and and doing many uh, see less rubbish coming from the oceans uh, coming from Lombok into the ocean. I see. I see. I see. Okay, so um, before I come to our closing of this session, there's one more question that I would like to ask you. Um, can you give us and the viewers just some small tip on a simple act that we can do or a change in our habit that can actually help in contributing to saving the environment? Okay. Well, uh, many, I've suggested many during the presentation, but yeah, start by, separating your rubbish and uh, composting and and then uh, uh, refill your water bottle rather than buying plastic bottles every day and uh, do not use plastic bags anymore always have some some bags reusable bags in in um, with you so you can do shopping anytime and then because in indonesia the street food is so cheap don't remember to it's always better to use your own plate or your own Tupperware box rather than, uh, rather than uh, using the plastic paper and, and uh, plastic bag. So, yeah. I see, I see. Does actually Lom does, does Lombok um, have that rule where there's no more plastic bags around? Because I do know that around Bali, we do not supply any more plastic bags. So we are forced to bring our own eco bags yeah, in, uh, in Bali, but not everywhere, the local market is still full of plastic bags, right? Yeah, true, true. Even, even Lombok is still using plastic bags? No, in Lombok, there, there was a national law, yeah, that if you want a plastic bag, you need to pay 200 rupiah for it. But <laughs> the, the, it never got enforced. So if you go shopping and you don't have your own bag, they're going to automatically give you a plastic bag. Yeah, there is, because the, again, the law is beautiful, but the enforcement and the control is not there. So they're just, yeah, they're just, they're not changing their habits because there is no sanction. So they still give plastic for free everywhere. I understand. I really feel that, I really feel that people should really, really start doing their own actions because I also feel very itchy every time people start holding plastic bags again when, you know, you can actually reuse an eco bag or a reusable bag that, that you can use for shopping and everything else. Um, okay, coming to our closing session, do you have any few last words that you would like to say? Uh, no, I'm just saying thank you very much for inviting me to contribute tonight and uh, and uh, I hope I inspired a few people and then uh, I'm just going to say I'm like, uh, keep on giving the good example and keep on raising awareness and keep on learning because there's so much to learn around and now that we're all confined and we have time to get on Google for any, any information, there's lots of good documentary and uh, and courses that we can learn so we can change the way we live. I see, I see. Actually, uh, we would love to thank you more for joining us on this event. And we are very, very honored to have you here with us. I'm definitely inspired with your sharings and stories. So I really feel that the viewers are as well very, very inspired. Thank you so much once again, Delphine, for sharing and for joining us. Thank and you very much. Thank, thank you. you.
Thank you. And for the viewers at home, I would like to remind you guys one more time on our donation. In commemoration of this day, uh, this Earth Day, the event will be collecting donations from you. And what you can do is scan the barcode on the screen right now. It will direct you to the ticketing and registration page. You can donate in a form of tickets and it will be limited up to maximum of five tickets on per account or email. Okay, that's actually all from me and the discussion with Delphin tonight. Once again, I would really, really love to thank everyone in this team and Delphin for joining us. And all right, guys, um, basically that has come to an official ending of this event. I would like to thank all the attendees, all the participants, and even all the moderators and all the amazing speakers from this morning session until now. And last but not least, thank you to all the teams behind the screen as well. To those who have donated, thank you so much. And we believe that the medic teams who will receive this donation will be very thankful as well. Thank you for tuning in till this last session. I'm Shani from Jujak In, and I wish you all to stay safe and healthy. Thank you and see you guys in the next event.